thanks everybody for bearing with us. Um, so thanks, uh, Patrick, for seeing my praises. I guess I get to skip this slide. Um, but yeah, just quickly, I'm, uh, I'm on the data science team at Cloudera. Uh, I was our first uh, Spark developer, and now we have a nice team of we're about four. Um, before that, I was working pretty heavily on uh, Hadoop, and particularly Yarn and MapReduce. Uh, I'm on the Hadoop project management committee. Um, before that, I was a WE undergrad. Um, so what is, uh, what is Yarn? Um, there's this sort of uh, very loose operating system analogy. Um, and I feel kind of bad using it because I think Mesos uh, came up with this in the first place. Um, but it applies, to, it applies to Yarn as well. Uh, in, a, in a typical operating system, you have, you have data and you have stuff that you're doing with it. Um, and so on a, a single machine, this is the file system. Uh, and then we have a, a kernel scheduler uh, and uh, some threads and process concept uh, that's allowing us to run programs on that data. Um, when we take that to a, to a cluster and we put that inside Hadoop, uh, we have sort of the same two, the same separation, the same uh, two components. Uh, but the, the storage layer is instead of a single node file system, it's HDFS. It's the Hadoop distributed file system. And Yarn takes this role of uh, doing execution, doing scheduling, uh, deciding what gets to run, uh, who gets to run. Uh, and uh, this is a you know, particular cluster problem uh, where, where to run. Um, so why would you want to run Spark uh, on this system, on Yarn? Uh, coming from you know, a background of working on and building distributed execution engines, I like to see it like this. We have HDFS, we have uh, all the data that we're processing on, and then we have these, uh, these different frameworks uh, that are doing all this good stuff, uh, good stuff to it. Um, this is not a great way to, to look at things from a resource management perspective. Uh, if you're trying to share a cluster between different organizations uh, within your larger organization, what you really want to see is a picture that's something like this, right? You want to say, okay, engineering is buying half of this cluster. Uh, they get to use half of it, and they should be able to use whatever tools uh, they want to within that half, uh, and likewise for other, uh, other uh, subdivisions inside the, inside the organization. Uh, and so this is, uh, this is the problem that Yarn really helps to solve. It allows us to run different processing frameworks uh, on the same data, um, and to share resources dynamically between those processing frameworks. So <clears throat> aside from uh, making uh, Spark coexist with MapReduce, coexist with Impala, coexist with Tez, why run Spark on Yarn? Um, <clears throat> managing workloads using advanced policies. Uh, Yarn has been around uh, for a while. Uh, it has a few different scheduler implementations and some pretty uh, some pretty advanced stuff has gone into uh, making it so that when you have different users, uh, different uh, subdivisions within your organization uh, going in together on a, a dupe cluster, you can be fair and uh, you can be very uh, specific and deliberate about who gets to use which resources uh, and which time. In particular, uh, you can divide up your, your cluster between different teams. Uh, you have hierarchical scheduling, so you can uh, divide up those teams into even smaller teams and those smaller teams into users. Uh, you have uh, queue placement policies and the fair scheduler, which allow you to, when you're submitting an application, automatically decide where to put it uh, based on characteristics like who's submitting it, uh, what, uh, what group they're in. Uh, and second of all, right now, Yarn is the only uh, Spark cluster manager uh, that allows you to run, uh, that, that allows you to run on a Kerberized Hadoop cluster. In a Kerberized Hadoop cluster, uh, all services authenticate uh, to each other. Um, Processes run not as not as spar as yarn, but as the actual users who are, who are submitting them. Uh, so right now, uh, <clears throat> the only way to spark, run Spark in this kind of secure setup is, is with yarn. So a, a brief history of, of Spark on yarn. Um, <clears throat> if Tom Graves is out there, he can probably correct me on any of this if it's wrong. Uh, but uh, around uh, late, late 2012, Yahoo started uh, thinking this would be a cool thing to do, started playing around with it. Um, it was eventually pulled into Spark, first only uh, in the Hadoop uh, 0.23 line, which is, uh, I believe, uh, the, first, uh, the first Hadoop line to include Yarn. Uh, but uh, it, it was a line that didn't have a lot of the other Hadoop 2 features, and Yarn is still alpha in this line. Uh, in early uh, 2014, uh, Spark 0.9, uh, there was support for the uh, Hadoop 2.2 line as well, um, and a mode that allowed you to uh, run Yarn Spark programs interactively on Yarn, whereas before you'd only been able to launch, uh, launch batch jobs. Uh, early 2014, uh, Spark uh, 091, 
Um, this is when uh, CDH finally began to include Spark on Yarn. Uh, and we, we consider it stable uh, starting, uh, starting at this point. Uh, we tell our customers to use it just as much as we tell them to use Spark standalone. So uh, probably half of the people at this talk are wondering, just is Spark on Yarn something uh, I can use at all? Yes, by all means, you should use it. Um, and then um, mid-2014, sort of uh, what's happening right now, Spark 1.0 was released, uh, a lot more stability, and then a uh, much simplified app submission through uh, this Spark submit script. So how does it work? What does it actually mean to run Spark on Yarn, and what does that look like uh, from a low-level services uh, operating with each other perspective? We're going to go sort of quickly over the Yarn architecture, what it means to submit a Yarn application, and then we'll talk about how Spark fits into that. So Yarn has these sort of uh, uh, central services. There's this dictator of the cluster, which is the resource manager, uh, and it's a really like, Stalin -like figure. It wants to uh, have control over everything that's going on in the cluster. It has all these, uh, these, these minions, these, uh, these, these KGB agents that are running on every machine in the cluster, and these are the node managers. So the resource manager, a single daemon, has a sort of global view of all the resources, um, decides who gets what, and then it has its minions, these node managers, and it tells them to enforce, uh, enforce those decisions. Uh, the third and you know, the reason the whole, uh, the whole system is there in the first place are containers. Uh, containers are the actual uh, user, the actual application code that, is trying, that Yarn is trying to run. Uh, when we talk about a container, uh, what we really mean is uh, some process uh, and possibly it's uh, child processes that, uh, that Yarn has started. Um, the interface to starting a container is basically you give Yarn a, a, a list of commands you want to run and you give it a bunch of files that you want it uh, uh, to be in that uh, in the environment when those commands are running, and that allows you a pretty—it's not just Java-based; it allows you a pretty uh, flexible, uh, flexible set of things you can run under the framework. So, <clears throat> back to before we had these containers, how does uh, how does a yarn job actually get started? How does someone uh, come to a yarn cluster and say, "I want to run uh, this code on it. I want to run this Spark application on it"? Um, first, there's a client, and a client is is not managed by yarn. Uh, it's someone who's asking Yarn to do something on its behalf. Um, <clears throat> the, client, the client will tell the resource manager, I have this, uh, I have this program, and it's, it's, it's going to drive my application. It knows what to do. It knows uh, what to request uh, to run the rest of my uh, distributed system on this cluster. Uh, and this is called an application master. So the, the client will give uh, the resource manager everything it needs to know in order to run this application master on the cluster. And the resource manager will go consult all its policies, consult its scheduler, and figure out a good place and time to run this on the cluster. Uh, <clears throat> once this comes, uh, the application master is there. It's like a, it's like a queen bee. It immediately starts uh, creating uh, little worker bees for itself all around the cluster. Um, it is the, it's the one responsible for talking to the resource manager after this. Uh, and saying, I want to run these containers, I want to run these processes uh, at other points on the cluster. Uh, <clears throat> so at last, we have our full, our full uh, application running in a cluster. Here we're talking about map tasks and reduce tasks. This is a sort of uh, map reduce uh, concept, obviously. Um, and so how does this actually get uh, fit into Spark? The Spark architecture is considerably simpler. Um, we also have a, a, a Stalinesque uh, Stalin figure um, and, a bunch of, uh, and a bunch of minions for him. Um, but there's no application master business, there's no, there's no separate client. Uh, with Spark, you have a driver that is making all, all the scheduling decisions, it's assembling uh, the DAG, and then it spawns these tasks uh, <coughs> inside executor processes. A pretty like, fundamental uh, distinction between the way that Spark works and the way that MapReduce works, which was uh, difficult to grasp for me when I was just trying to wrap my head around everything, is that many Spark tasks run in a single JVM. Uh, both concurrently and over that JVM's lifetime. Uh, and that JVM is called, the, is called the executor process. That is the KGB agent of, of Yarn. Uh, sorry, of Spark. So <coughs> the, uh, <coughs> there's a sort of here. Yeah, there we go. There's a, uh, this beautiful little overlay that I have. Um, <coughs> the executors run inside these Yarn containers. Uh, and, and, and they're sort of the, the fundamental processes that Spark needs to start up uh, inside of Yarn. And once these executors are running, uh, the Spark driver can communicate with them with directly with them directly and doesn't really need to speak to Yarn anymore. Um, 
uh, and does all of its task scheduling and farming out of tasks to these executor processes independently of the YARN system. So <coughs> this, shows, uh, this shows our executor, uh, super nice. The question uh, now is where do we put the Spark driver? In some sense, it might make sense to put it uh, <coughs> in the client. The client is the one, uh, is the process that's initiating the application. If, uh, if it's an interactive application, the client is gonna be where the user is, uh, and they should be able to issue uh, commands and see results from this client. And then second of all, it might make sense to put the, uh, <coughs> to put the driver inside the application master. The client shouldn't have to stick around. For example, in a MapReduce job, uh, you launch the job, the client can go away, the job will uh, run to completion. You should be able to restart this job um, and have uh, all the yarn, uh, nice high, like high availability st stuff uh, uh, work out. <coughs> so Spark on Yarn's answer to this is basically, let's do both. There's two different modes. There's yarn client mode and there's yarn, uh, yarn cluster mode. Yarn client mode maybe predictably is the one in which the uh, driver runs inside the client and yarn cluster mode, the driver runs uh, inside an application master on the cluster. So this is what this looks like. Uh, sorry, we're using totally different colors in all our uh, boxes and squares. <coughs> uh, but we have th this, this, uh, this client, which also happens to house the Spark driver. It houses the, um, the Stalin of Spark, which is making all these scheduling decisions uh, and sending tasks out to the executors. Uh, we have to have an application master because the application master is the one that is going to request those containers for us in the, f uh, in the first place. But the ap application master is pretty dumb. Um, it's really a minion as well. Uh, we launch it, it comes up, and it starts asking for executors around the cluster, and it doesn't really do anything after that. If an executor goes down, if something, uh, if something bad happens, it'll notice that and say, okay, can we replace this guy? Uh, but otherwise, it's pretty much just sitting there and all the smarts are, all the smarts are in the Spark driver. Uh, and yarn cluster mode, which uh, was recently called yarn standalone mode, but we took that out because it was very uh, confusing with the Spark standalone cluster manager. Uh, the client really doesn't do much at all. The client uh, comes up, launches the job, maybe reports its progress while it's running uh, to, the, to the terminal, but it isn't involved in the driving of the application. Uh, the application master comes up and then immediately launches the user code, immediately launches the Spark driver, um, and, uh, and runs the application from there. So a few, uh, a few additional concerns worth mentioning. Uh, one thing is data locality. So <clears throat> when running a job, Spark pays attention to, uh, to data locality. Uh, it tries to place tasks alongside HDFS blocks. And this uh, is super easy when you're running with a Spark standalone cluster manager because you try to have an executor uh, on every single machine. One of the nice things about running Spark jobs uh, on Yarn is that you can have a much more limited, uh, <coughs> you can run executors on a much more limited subset of machines. If you have a thousand uh, and your job is only dealing with a few hundred megabytes of data, uh, you don't want to have, uh, you don't want to have executors everywhere. Um, the problem is that Spark needs to ask Yarn for executors uh, before it runs its jobs. So Spark only knows uh, where it's uh, supposed to send containers. It only knows where the data is when it initiates a job. Uh, but by the time we've gotten to that point, we should have already allocated our executors across the cluster. So we get around this with uh, this concept of uh, preferred node location data. And this requires a little bit of, uh, a little bit <coughs> of participation on behalf of the user where the user, when it's, uh, when it's initializing its Spark application, uh, tells Spark, I'm gonna be processing these files, so try to make sure, uh, try to, make sure to place my executors uh, nearby the blocks, nearby the data for these files, so that I won't have to uh, go across the network to get their contents. Um, this API could probably use a little bit uh, of prettification, um, but it's only, it's only one line right now, or one, one very long line. The future, what, what is in store for Spark on Yarn? What, would we, what are the features we would love to have? Uh, what are we working on at Cloudera or uh, hoping to work on in the next few months? Uh, the biggest thing is not being greedy. Right now, Spark on Yarn um, is, a, is a real Scrooge. Uh, and 
Spark apps hold on to the full resources even when they're idle. This isn't a super huge problem when you're running a batch job. Uh, you come up, you grab some resources, you use them fully, uh, and then you give them back to the system. Um, the issue is uh, uh, if a user wants to do something interactive, wants to start up a Spark application, load some data into memory, maybe think for five minutes about what the right thing is to do, uh, and then run a job, and then run the job on that data. Um, in this case, unfortunately, uh, Yarn is still counting all those cores that uh, the Spark application is using uh, as taken up, even though uh, no one's using them at all. And Yarn will, uh, during those five minutes, not give those resources to, to anybody else. Um, this is a, a, you know, a problem that we've had several of our customers complain to us about, um, that their users are basically hogging resources that they're not using at all. Uh, so we'd really like Spark on Yarn to be able to give back to the cluster uh, when, uh, <coughs> when it's not using all these resources. Um, this relies on some Yarn work uh, that has actually been uh, planned for a while, but is still, uh, is, is still in the works. Uh, this is Yarn 1197, the ability to uh, resize a container. So <coughs> right now, uh, a container in Yarn has a fixed resource allocation. It has uh, some number of megabytes that it's allowed to use. Uh, if it goes over that, it gets killed. And then it has some uh, number of cores that it's allowed to use. Uh, and uh, C groups are used to actually uh, make sure that it doesn't use uh, more CPU power than is allowed. Um, so, so having work in Yarn that would allow us to, uh, uh, at runtime, change that amount, say, uh, OK, uh, this, uh, <coughs> this container can't use these uh, CPU cores at this time, I would make it so that Yarn wouldn't have to, uh, so that Spark on Yarn would not have to be as greedy. Um, so I think the first thing uh, is CPU. I think that would get us most of the way there. Uh, and second of all, it would be really nice if we could do uh, the same sort of dynamic uh, resource stuff for memory. Um, this, unfortunately, Java is not really great at giving back memory to the OS. That would require uh, probably a fair bit of work in Spark uh, to store stuff uh, uh, off heap, maybe leverage Tachyon for that. Spark, or Patrick, am I running over time? Okay, sweet. Um, great. Um, integration with the, uh, with the application timeline store. So <coughs> for, uh, for most of Yarn's lifetime, uh, MapReduce has been the, the primary framework that people run on it. And MapReduce has this really nice uh, job history server that uh, ties, really, uh, ties really well with Yarn. Uh, so if you run a MapReduce job, uh, data, MapReduce will aggregate certain data to HDFS or whatever distributed file system you're using. Uh, and then this job history server can take that data and serve it to you and tell you stuff about uh, your job's performance and its execution after it's completed. Uh, in Yarn, we don't have this right now. If you want to look at logs for a completed job, uh, you actually have to do that over the, the command line. There's a, there's a Yarn logs uh, <coughs> a Yarn logs command. A lot of people aren't even aware of this, and I've you know, been at customer sites where they just thought that looking at executor logs was something they could not do after a job had completed. Um, so <coughs> salvation is near. Uh, first of all, there's the Spark history server, um, which, is, uh, which, which is a super awesome effort to uh, store and serve Spark data, uh, data about Spark applications after they've completed. Um, and then more generically, uh, there's this concept in Yarn of the application timeline store. And the idea is that instead of having a history server for, for MapReduce, history server uh, for Spark, uh, we have a generic service that's built to take all of this history data, take all, this, uh, all the timeline data, any uh, metrics, counters, uh, logs, um, and aggregate that. Uh, for, for everybody. So, so this is uh, close to completion in Yarn itself, and uh, when this is stable, we'd like to, to integrate it with the Spark History Server. We'd like to be able to plug in the Spark uh, UI into this and allow you to basically have a single service running that uh, manages all your application history across different frameworks. I'm going to skip this because it's kind of far out. Um, and the last thing is just uh, really smoothing out the rough, the rough edges. Uh, we consider Spark on Yarn stable. Uh, it works. It's not going to crash on you uh, in a lot of situations. But there are a lot of things about it that could uh, be a lot nicer. Looking at logs should be way easier, as, as we just discussed. Uh, even while an application is running, there's this sort of roundabout way that you have to go to find the logs. Uh, you, you look on the nodes and then look at the containers and the nodes. Um, and a lot of users aren't aware they can do this either. Uh, <clears throat> better APIs and docs for the, for the data locality. Uh, possibly working out, the, you know, there is the, this beautiful API that we were looking at earlier. Possibly making this a tad bit, a tad bit simpler uh, would be nice. Um, 
removing some unnecessary sleeps, uh, the way that the, the yarn, Spark on Yarn Code bootstraps right now, it basically just says, I'm going to wait a flat three seconds for all of my executors to come up. Uh, in a small job, it should take away less than that for those executors to heartbeat in uh, and waiting three seconds for every job, which is kind of, kind of silly. Um, and then last of all, uh, long-running apps on secure clusters. Uh, this is a pretty important, uh, pretty important for applications like Spark Streaming, uh, where you want to leave an application running for a really long time. Uh, Yarn currently has this, uh, this issue uh, with, uh, with container tokens, where they expire after a set interval, I think normally uh, one or two weeks. Uh, and if you want your application to run longer than this, you're just pretty much, uh, you're pretty much out of luck. So uh, either making that uh, extendable, so in a secure way, uh, it, those tokens can last forever, or uh, having some sort of uh, token replacement policy would be something really, uh, really useful for these kinds of situations. Uh, and that's all I have, so thanks a lot. So, Monty, do you have a few questions? So, Samuel, do you have a few questions? Also, if our next speakers could come up, then we can get started. Uh, so the, the question was, <coughs> how is the locality that we talked about different than rack awareness? Um, so both of those are uh, considered sort of under the same, under the same umbrella. Uh, when you report the, uh, the locations for uh, blocks on HDFS, uh, there's stuff that allows you to look up the racks that those blocks are associated with. Uh, so both when making scheduling decisions uh, inside Spark of where to put tasks and both, uh, and also making scheduling decisions where to place executors uh, for Yarn, um, you can be rack aware. Uh, the question is, uh, when you run in, uh, in client mode, do you still take advantage of the resource manager? Uh, so yeah, I mean, essentially, you're doing pretty much the same thing. All of the executors are running uh, inside Yarn containers. The node manager is starting them up. Uh, you have an application master that's requesting containers. Uh, the difference is just where the Spark driver runs. It doesn't run inside the cluster. It runs in the, uh, in the Spark client. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Wrapping up. Yeah. Another round of applause for Sandy. Thanks.